Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that's changing the way businesses retain their attorneys. Go to GertzbergLaw.com to learn more. While you're there, check out Cover My Six, a complete legal audit of the six areas that most often create or prevent business lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how we keep you safe. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. On the SWAT team, I had 167 armed one-on-one confrontations. What? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in for such a treat today. Oh my goodness. Hi, Alex Gertzberg. Hi, Molly Gebler and Jessica Deviljack. What's yeah. up? We got, a, to, we got a, a special I friend know. here. You're going to have to sit closer to the mic, Jess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Could Jessica possibly not want to be on mic anymore? Oh, she'll warm up. She she'll get a couple up. more sips of her flow in there and she'll be fine. Saying. What's up, ladies? How's it going? Good. It's like a Wonderful. rose between a thorn between, between two, two roses. roses. How about that? Is that a, is that the is that it's the way that the saying way. goes? It's not yes. the way. No. A thorn between but it two is. roses. That's not, it's a, that's the, it's the other way. But okay. we're gonna go with that way All right. today. I'm down. I'm yeah, cool. yeah. So what's going on? Nothing, uh, man. Has it been ages? I think it ha- it really has. Ages. And it ages. really really has. You've been. You know, when you become a grandma, you're just. Uh, well, you been you went to New York. I did. Emily is moved in. She is starting her, well, she already had started, remember, mm-hmm. she was living on Long Island. Now she's in a, a an adorable apartment on Roosevelt Island, so super cute. Yeah. It is nestled between Manhattan and Queens. Is that, uh, do you have to take like an elevator to get there? There is a tram from, there's a tram on a cable Yeah. from Roosevelt to Manhattan. Then you can subway from Roosevelt to Manhattan, but if you want to take a car, you have to go back to Queens and take, I think it's Ed Koch, um, Roosevelt okay. Bridge or something I remember like that. Um, going down that it's tram that, on the cable. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the first smallpox hospital was there, supposedly haunted. It's now a Ooh. shell. Like there's no like a shell it, gas station or a shell no like a shell like it, it a reminds shell of a, building. a shell of a building it reminds see. me okay. of like um, Squire's Castle, yeah. you know there's like nothing in it nothing mm-hmm. in it and then um, there was the old insane asylum where the military would put their crazies, and it was very famous and think, also supposed to be haunted. I think they prefer disabled. Oh, got you, got you. The <laughs> mentally ill right. part of me, part of me. Um, uh, good, yeah, that's man. yeah. Um, Have you been going to New York much more frequently lately? It seems that way. It, you know, yes, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know what? Really, just to get her settled in. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we had gotten her settled into Long Island, and then uh, we had to like this was the official like we moved her out of Kent, yeah. moved her stuff to so she's officially move but it's it's so cute yeah so cute it's 20 minutes door to door from work to apartment um summertime in new york city is one of the greatest things in the world is it I, you don't like it mm, no, no fan. Was it too, too hot? hot yeah really it's concrete jungle it's, yeah. yeah during the summer i wouldn't that hmm. would not be my preference fall and, and early winter would be spring but not summer it's a hot box. Well, when I've been there in the summertime, it's been relatively cool. And, and my favorite parts of the city to go to in the summertime are the NYU campus and then um, Central Park. Mm. Yeah, we didn't. I didn't even get to Manhattan this last trip. I was there for you five there days. But I there huh. was no reason to... I was moving her from Long Island to Roosevelt, so there was no reason to go into the city. Gotcha. Okay, um, does she like her new job? She Which loves I guess, her new job. Similar to her old job. It's kind of like Whoa, her, her yeah, internship um, was similar to that, right? Kind of, sort of. You know, she's more, um, you know, she's his his personal assistant. So okay. um, she loves it. She loves it. He's so dear to her. Um, yeah. 
he really is a, a wonderful, wonderful guy. So Christian, shout out, Christian. Christian needs to get up, get on this podcast. I know. Already. Wouldn't that oh, be yeah. great? It's going to happen. I was thinking he could be our annual awards speaker <gasps> for next year. We could have like a little that. fashion show. It could be, it could be, he could make my gown. Yeah. Yeah, oh I know, because he dresses for um, the um, <laughs> the Lots. bigger size ladies. Not always, like, but he does. Um, Why all, would he dress you sizes. up, then, Molly? Right, that's all true. Sizes. Yeah, because I'm of the bigger size. No, stop. <laughs> yeah, I know it's true. true. I just hide it really, really well. It, so, yeah, um, um, so okay. that's really what I've been doing. P- twin update. You know, they're still good and growing. Um, nice. That's what they you were want. baptized. They were I baptized. Think, I think that was. Did they go reference. full dunk on the baptism? You know, no. No. Um, what's the? What's they just, the, they just pour water on their yeah, head, right? Oh, really? head. But what the priest did this time, which I really, really loved, he brought all the little kids up to the fountain. The fountain. I don't think that's what they call it, but the bowl with the holy <laughs> water. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. The and holy he bowl. had them all put their hands in it. And be a part of it. And I just thought that was so great. Uh, Of course, then after they left, they're all like flinging it around. And I'm like, you know, that could have been an opportunity (laughs) to talk about what they just put their hands in and how Mm. it's holy and they shouldn't be, you know. But but I thought it was a cute way to kind of. And then they were kind of there. You know, they were all focused in on the baptism. Well, when when you get baptized as a grown-up, don't they go full dunk in the river I think river some something? of the other religions, Maybe. the non-denominationals oh, ca- do, yeah. like, in a river, and they dunk you. Yeah. And But that's not the Catholic, no. Got it. The Catholic faith. Okay. But, but, yeah, it's, um, yeah, Good. so they were. Nice job, yeah. John and Mary, getting John yourselves and Mary baptized. John and Mary got in the baptized. Does, do, do you get, um, when you're baptized, do you get, um, some like rights and privileges as a Catholic that you didn't have before you were baptized. Like, do you can you are you do you become a Catholic by being baptized? Is that how that works? Um, you're officially welcomed into the Catholic Church okay. through baptism. So I yes. couldn't just like call myself a Catholic. I'd have to get baptized to be a Catholic. Correct. You'd have to have all the sacred. The, there's sacraments. Com- sacraments, communion, confirmation. Marriage is a sacrament. You don't have to have marriage to be mm-hmm. a Catholic, but that is one of the sacraments. Death is one of the sacraments. What is that? Um, so much more Catholic than I am. I yeah. Um, <laughs> what else? Penance. Yeah, I don't know. Penance. This has been yeah. Catholic I don't know. Talk. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, but it was they cried the entire time. Um, not having anything to do with the water, like like it had nothing to do with that. It was they were just soup crabby actually we found out the next day that john had a tooth coming in right. so mm. that's really what it was but uh um, gotcha all good all right. all nice good. job yeah. gabblers yeah all good i guess they're not um, ga- so that's that what about you man i've had a very active couple of weeks yeah. Molly. Well, you went to the cedar point oh. we uh um my gal tiffany and i we randomly on a whim Spent an entire day of uh, roller coaster riding. We rode roller coasters until we threw up. Do you no still kids. ride roller coasters? Still. I can't do it anymore. No? No. We did it until we um, were ready to pass out. And in fact, on Millennium Force, Tiffany blacked out <gasps> on the ride. Shut up. Yeah, so yeah. what does that mean? You have to revive her? Mouth to mouth no, what? No, it means we didn't go a second time like I wanted to. <laughs> oh, my. Did you think she was dead? Like, what do you mean blacked out? Like, she came to while we were going, getting back to the station. Oh so the my. whole ride, so she, she was, was out? Like, like this. I mean, and... what? Did you Millennium, even know? Millennium Force is so so intense and so fast that's what made so me powerful. stop writing you get so are you enjoying oh, it oh so much no so, ha- so how, much. like no. let's just take this yeah. particular because i love a good roller coaster yeah. but let's take this one in particular yeah. where you're going so fast you don't you black out how how what's the enjoyment of that you have to be a bit of an adrenaline junkie to to really want to do that and appreciate it and want to keep going back uh, like I do um I guess if I don't know like I like, like skydiving and paragliding and jumping off of stuff like and weird, I like, like I'm taking the wooden roller coaster and jog yeah. like like you know, that was so much Lame. fun and you get a little tickle in your vagina when you went down the big hill <laughs> 
Right, right. I, that never Call happened to me. Whichever that, one I you never are talking about. <laughs> but I just can't. I, with this, the one you're speaking of yeah. right now, I would just think that you'd be on and off. And it, it, like, there's no time for that enjoying it. Oh, well, I totally disagree okay. with you there, okay. Molly. Yeah, yeah I, I think people enjoy it. I okay. did. Like, I got off there. I thought it was going to. Vomit. So you yeah. wrote the, the same one he... when it opened, yeah, yeah and that it... was when I was like, I can't do this anymore. That's the fastest roller coaster yeah. in the world. Can't do it. Really? Yeah, and then and the other one that's right next and to what it. What else are you doing on it other than fast? Like, are you whooping, looping around? That one's got some loop de loops. Yeah, okay. it's got some tunnels which are really freaky. Um, inside the tunnels are strobe lights. Um, mm. Yeah, that one is just all about speed. And okay. then there's another one called uh, Top Thrill Dragster, which is just. Yeah, that's you, insane. You go like Mach 3, right? You feel like you're getting shot into space. And that one is just up to the t like super tall height and then down, yeah. right? But and then straight up. Just straight up and then you're you. twisting and then you're twisting while you're going up. Um, oh, and then there's this one called the Val Raven, which is amazing. That one, you go up and you sit there at the top hanging over and just staring down into the abyss without falling for like uh, like 10 seconds and uh I yeah my neck is hurting yeah it's and then and then when you it. drop when you drop there is no resistance like from i don't know 8000 feet until you get to the bottom there's just no friction you're just dropping that's amazing um may i taste your wine yeah. please um, so we did that. We loved it. Um, and then, oh, and then on the way back from Cedar Point the next day, you like that wine? Yeah, yeah that's some courtesy Malbec. of Rob Sapp. Oh, well, thanks, Rob Sapp. Yeah. Well, it was for me, but I'm sharing since you we, shared the dom. Thanks, Molly Gebler. I mean, it ain't no dom Perignon, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> I'm just joking. This is from Mendoza, Argentina. And it's home, a gorgeous bottle. World capital of the Malbecs. That's good stuff. Oh, okay. See what on the way on the way back from um, Sandusky, we drove through Huron and went to a winery there. Um, forget what it's called, but it was amazing. And then after that, we went to Vermilion. Have you guys ever been to Vermilion? I just know it, but I just saw a little article in Cleveland Magazine about it. My mother and had her so first date pretty. with my stepdad in Vermilion. We used to. Did you go to Chez Francois? We went on. There. Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> oh wait, I got a beef with that That's place. Like I'm going to tell you. That's like the restaurant there oh, that boy. everybody. I hope they're listening right now. Oh, Let me tell you what happened. Oh boy. First of all, We're great, them. great restaurant, <laughs> great decor, amazing food. Can yeah. boats go up to it? No. But we sit down, and uh, uh, the bartender uh, tells us about the um, the. Spe the appetizer specials one of them is this crab lobster shrimp mm, deal bring it yeah. right yeah no problem bring mm -hmm. it on mm -hmm. had it tasted amazing get the bill thirty dollars <gasps> oh. i go my man <laughs> don't you think you ought to give a, a dude a little heads up for a, before you give him a thirty dollar appetizer and he goes yeah you know i thought about saying something i go right there when you thought about saying something yeah you should have you should have said something yeah i mean what am i gonna do i'm gonna you know i'm not gonna right. like bitch about it. Enjoyed it so and... then i go how often do people get sticker shock over this appetizer and he goes a good amount <laughs> so he come on know francois oh my yeah goodness. that's not cool. ridiculous not yeah. cool no no um we went there on a yacht the um guy that used to own um William K. Wesley was his name, and he owned Blaster back in the Ooh. beginning prior to um, the, whatchamacallit's owning it now. The current owner. The Porter's okay. owning it now. Mr. Porter and the w William K. Wesley and my dad all kind of started the Blaster back in the day. In Vermilion. Uh, but he had a yacht in Vermilion. But that was when my mom and my stepdad went on their first date. How cute. My mom was super nervous. And she brought all four of us. Now, she was a, a single gal at 32. Um, and we were two, four, six, and eight. But at this time, we were, I think we were 12. And my dad still talks about it. Now, I ordered the lobster. 
<laughs> Dude, I sure as hell hope he didn't pay $30 he, for it. He knew at that point that he was in big trouble with this family. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we just talked about that story the other it's day. A, it's, a, it's a cool town. Yeah. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, we did that. And then, um, you know who was in town last Wednesday? Oh, my gosh. I was. Were you? Oh, no, I wasn't. You weren't. I don't know. I don't know. Jess, were you in town? Um, I was. Only the greatest rock band of all time. Oh, please don't tell me. Fish was in town. Oh my gosh, is yeah. that where you got? Is that where you got your water bottle? Which, no, no, that's not this. on. Are right. they officially a rock band? Which, they're only the greatest. <laughs> they do f- have their own radio station, which I oh, I yeah, sent a just, text and to their Alex. own ice cream and, and right they Ben do and Jerry. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Did I mean, you listen to that radio station? Oh, uh, you just took a picture of it yes. and sent it to me. <laughs> it was a commercial on my radio station. <laughs> it's a great radio station. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I got I got this in at a at a fish festival I went to in Mexico. Here's here's what I think happens and and correct me if I'm wrong. You Do know you, I will. Is it like just a big pot fest at no. these? Is that the kind of Probably. band it is? Absolutely I would imagine not. That. Right, that's what I imagine some, it to be. Some ganja is consumed by some people some of the time. Okay, but it is um, an amazing. I imagine like this. A so lot, I see a lot of Tevas and tie dye. So for for the kids listening at home, Molly just did a fake seizure for some reason. <laughs> no, I did what you would see as ladies dancing at yeah. um, Woodstock. Oh, that kind of up in the arm waving, yeah, eyes I, closed type right. of yeah, praying I, to the I mean, gods. Sure, look, people dance in their own styles. <laughs> um, it. God, I wish you guys would just go. You should. I wish you would have gone to this one. This was amazing. There's a lot of like, like 22 minute solo jams and yep. lengthy so improvisational. A lot of, a lot of that. Yes. Um, yes. It was a great concert, but it was uh, it was the 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 first one that Tiffany and I went to together. Mm-hmm. And try to convert. No, she's she's gone she's, to one before. She okay. likes fish, which is okay. why she and I get along so well. Gotcha. Uh, she we had the best <laughs> time. We had the best time. Um, I'll tell you guys hmm. are like kids. Yeah. Yeah, she's good people. Little kids. Oh, and then um He's got his notes over there. I do. Well I I what do you call a fish with no eyes? <laughs> That's a good clean joke there, Jesse. And you thought you'd have I, nothing to say. That's hilarious. Well, thanks to Alex for bringing the fish up. Yes. That's what I think of. When yes, I hear fish. I love um, it. You know who's coming to Chagrin Falls, November sixteenth? <laughs> Jessica knows. Is it? Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. It is Elton John. The actual one. Well, no, but <laughs> but <laughs> Captain, Captain Fantastic, Fantastic. Mm-hmm. who sounds exactly like Elton John. I mm-hmm. thought Captain Fantastic was your pet name for me. <laughs> Don't tell people that. <laughs> My bad. I'm gonna have to come up with another one for you. Sorry. Um, uh, I'll tell you what. This. Do you? Are, can you go online with that? With, with what, your computer right what, now? No, I just put it in airplane. Oh. I, fo- I was following instructions. Well, I'm going to have Nally put a link to this guy. Right. He is unbelievable, and we are throwing the biggest couples night fundraiser. You're going to open up with a comedian and finish it off with mm. Captain Fantastic. Who, do you have a comedian it's, booked already? I do. Can you I say do. Who it is? I don't. I can't because I haven't read it on the contract. Okay. The booker booked the comedian. Uh, he, but he's a. This isn't like just some Joe Schmo down no, the street. These are um, legit, legit comedians, and it's just going to be the nice. the best best night. Where will in it the be world. held? It will be held in the new intermediate uh, community room that's just being built. Oh, um, in the uh, intermediate school. school. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sharon Falls. Yes, Excellent. yeah. There's only 500 seats. Um, Excellent. Tomorrow you'll get an email for sponsoring because um, okay. we're only doing. We already have two because we. Did some pre-sponsoring, um, but um, so we have four more spots. I um, would like to see that Elton John movie that's out. I saw it. Did you? Tell I me. did. Did you like okay, it? Okay, so okay, so we were going to see it this weekend and then went boating instead. Uh oh. You know it's mixed reviews. It is because I didn't anticipate it being very La La Landish. And it you know, was. it's all kind of in his head. So people are breaking out in song and dancing on the street when he was growing up. Oh. So I didn't, 
maybe if I went in with that mindset. See, I like movies like that. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, what have you been up to on your uh, when you're not um, toiling away in the um, in the, the land chamber of misfits. office? <laughs> in the land of misfits. <laughs> Parenting is, number is my number one issue lately. Mm. Yeah. Um, no, but you said you went boating. I was with some friends in Roaming Shores over the weekend. Where's so. Roaming Shores? Like, I think it's Ashtabula County, okay. maybe. I don't know. Is it? It's Route 6 a whole long way out. All right. Oh. But Big it's boat like or little 45. Boat? Um, she made her own boat out of cardboard. We did. The <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it one of those like competitions? Well, they're they're having one um, the Fourth of July weekend. So, we, friends of ours have a house out there, and we decided we were going to enter the contest this year. So, Lovely. we were building the cardboard boat this weekend, um, which has not sailed yet. Not it's yet. Going to. It okay. will. So, do you put something on the bottom? No, it's only cardboard and tape, and you're allowed to use glue on the joints. Like we thought, oh sweet, we'll get some like flex seal and just spray yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> You're not allowed. So. Can you use tape on the bottom of the boat? Mm-mm. Only a, with the seams and the joints. Really? They don't want you like just duct taping the no. whole thing. No, yeah, yeah, you can't around. duct tape the bottom boat. to no. keep the water. No, out. so huh. several layers of cardboard and lots of tape and glue. How, how many people are supposed to be in it? Two. Two people. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. And how far is just the person it's, that can get the farthest? It's a 200 yard race. <laughs> so are there different um pounds of cardboard like different poundage like mm, paper great question yeah you want to get that like, thick corrugated well, heck yeah, that's why, that corrugate it's a, you could use corrugated cardboard but we didn't so we have several layers of just your so you can layer cardboard. it so you yeah. can and are you choosing the two lightest people <laughs> anyone knows? Um, Mary and John. No, not, <laughs> we've got one that's light and one is for strength. So, Oh, because uh, oh, someone's got a paddle. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, it'll be fun to see. Mm. I've always thought that would be a fun thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like those kinds of like feats of ingenuity and yeah. you know constructing things that are supposed to sink and yeah. fall apart. But instantly. the the coolest thing they don't give they give out a prize obviously for the fastest and then the most creative, but also um, for the one that sinks in the most spectacular way. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. so if you're going so down, you're going down, you better do it upright. <laughs> I love that. Pull out all the stops. Fun. Do you have a name for your boat? Mm. Um. Well. Not officially, but our friend's last name is Dodie, so I thought Dodie's Bodie would be kind of cute. Oh, oh that's that cute. is cute. <laughs> I don't know. That's cute. Don't Dodie know. was uh, Gloria Vanderbilt's nanny's name. Oh, really? Maybe yeah. they're related. What I learned on my way to New York and back, all the all the books on tape that I listened to. This has been useless facts, <laughs> sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm. Um, uh, we have a, you know, I'm in that Freedom Boat Club, and yes. whenever we're in a yeah, boat, yeah, I bought a trip with you two years uh, ago. Geez. You had to take oh, me. I out. wish you would just yeah. finally just say it. yes. Let's go. Can you just pick a date and we can do it? I, how about tomorrow? Because I think Deb Luxow. Also I'll pick any day. Anyway, so whenever we, whenever I go boating on it, um, my boat is called the USS Arbitration. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just say that out loud because you can't, or do you put some <laughs> special sign on the side? I uh, I talk like a pirate the entire time. <laughs> I get on it, I put an eye patch on, and a oh funny my hat. Oh my goodness! Great. Anywho, Anywho. So, Jessica, other than building cardboard boats, any any other highlights? Well, I mean, since last Jessica was here, that's been months, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. Give us like a give us like a big, you know, major. How highlight. many months were you at the chamber at that time? I mean, you were kind of new. I don't remember when we did that. Yeah, yeah probably one month. I mean, maybe in, no, say. it was maybe six. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's been like a year and a half now, right? Yeah. Any mm-hmm. any highlights from the last year and a half, no, Jess? No, not nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we're pumping. It Do out, you guys man. get sick of each other ever? Never. Do no. I need to separate you two so that you can answer that question? A little candidly? bit today when Jessica was having a prima donna moment about lettuce. Let's talk oh about it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I started, little backstory. I is, started the prima donna moment. Yes. Cause with, I, yes. Can we say who it was about? Yeah. Who cares, yeah, sure, right? So sure Dave there. subs. M- Molly's had two instances of them not making her sub I mean, right the sauce is it like right. i finished that's what that makes sandwich yeah. and i'm like this is the best sandwich ever like every time i finish a, a dave sub i'm like yeah oh. the last two times 
I've asked for some extra sauce because they barely put any on. I mean, it's all about yeah. the sauce. It Let's just hasn't honest. been right. That's it, what, that, it puts the cosmic in yeah, Dave's yeah, cosmic sauce. All right. about, uh, actually, I saw Dave yesterday. <laughs> really? Yeah. Anywho, so, so yeah. So she calls the order today and is like, hey, listen, the past couple times, that whole story, said that same she thing. said the same thing to the guy. So, to you know, girl. put the sauce on the, the sub. And so we send our intern to get it and she comes back and she goes, they were out of lettuce. And I'm like, what? Jessica <laughs> flipped out. Are you telling wow. me you gave me a turkey Dave with no I lettuce? I don't want it. Like, well, what the I f- don't is want that? It. It's a bunch of turkey on a roll. It's a big hunk of turkey, and I don't want it. <laughs> I'm like, Jessica. Right? There's a grocery store across the street. Go buy some freaking lettuce. Hard. Right? Oh, she was so funny. I was, I was she ate it. Upset. You ate it? She ate it. Well, we split one. Uh, yeah. Because we're going to a big private party tonight. Oh, but I'll tell you, they got the tonight. sauce right because it was like Oh, they love. Oh, it was a big F you on the yeah, sauce. Yeah. For the sure. Whole sandwich you want like, sauce? Yeah. Here I'll you go. show you sauce. And, and, that's, and how, that's how the sandwich. It was just like, wow. It. <laughs> it was like yeah. just drenched in sauce, huh? And we'll, yeah. we'll skip the lettuce. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah. So right. yeah, but I mean, no, I, I, I That's think the extent of your irritability with each other is when <laughs> I think Jessica so. doesn't get her lettuce. I'm waiting for her to get sick of like, like today, Sam Facebooked and it was, um, um, I mean, you can't even, how it was can Mary I get- on face, you know, it was a Facebook live with Mary or whatever. Mm. And no, I'm waiting for her to say, Oh my gosh, enough with these grandbabies. No, but I go running over to her <laughs> house. Like, let me see. Oh, don't like, how can you her. say no? Uh, I mean, yeah. No. And me yelling at Amazon this morning, which is an everyday. I could, I don't but. know how you got, I mean, it's not a big space and you guys no. are like, it's two I would say desks. It's probably this size almost. Right. I mean, a little bigger, but oh, yeah. Oh my God, I would murder the both of you if I had to be you know what? I, in there with you all day. I will tell you that that was definitely thought of through the hiring process, for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, I that mean, was... Not even like a privacy wall. Not even no. like one of those I have like, a, Japanese... Um, uh, I have a do not disturb like that you hang on your hotel room. I have that hanging on my lamp. And there are some days where I'll say to Jessica, I, I'm not here, like I... I just need to do something and I, yeah. I can't, you know, she's got to, anybody that walks through the door, she's got to get them out of here them. or, yeah. um, the, okay. you know, but yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. And yeah. friendship outside of the office. That helps. Because here's the deal. I, you know, you're spending, I'm spending more time with Jess than I am with my husband, w- with anybody. Right. I mean, you're eight hours, f- five days a week yeah. and more for us. So why wouldn't you it, it, you it, it just consumes and we're a very casual office so we're talking about our family lives or things that happened or so yeah. you know you might as well be with somebody that you enjoy because if not it's going to be a long day i mean I, i'll tell and you you've been there yeah that's a big part of our employment relations here is the acknowledgement that we spend more time with each other mm-hmm. than we do with our families and that's okay that's well yeah okay. but but uh, the point of it is that if you're not going to have fun, then this isn't the place for you. And sure. if you're not, and if you're going to be a pain in the ass with each other, and if there's going to be like office politics and stuff like that, this isn't right. the place for yeah. you. And I think that employers and supervisors and managers who don't acknowledge that and who just view their employees as labor, as opposed to family members, mm-hmm. are just doomed to um, not have that kind of um, spirit among them and fellowship among them and Mm -hmm. you know and they will feel it they will feel that they are i mean look she's here we just can't we can't separate each other (laughs) and we've done a a shallow duet we sing together we sing together um, we did the karaoke thing yeah Yeah, we did can i tell you what somebody told me oh Oh. about uh, have you guys ever heard of um porn karaoke No, oh listen to this. tell me more. I learned about this at the Fish concert. Of course, course you did. did. <laughs> no, a friend of mine. This is so crazy. This is tell so me more. crazy. I, okay, are people so naked? Kids, so kids, this is this is the part of the podcast. Go potty, parents. parents you're going to want to pause it here. Put the earmuffs on the kids. But it, it's too good not to talk about. I need to know. So apparently. <laughs> Um, my friend Artie, who was there at the uh, at the at the fish show, went to a party, and at this party, there was um, a screen, and um, but no sound, and they invited people up on stage to, and they gave them a mic, 
And they Stop had it. to talk out and sound out what they saw on the screen. Was it a porn? Yes. So, Stop it. So, I want an invitation. So listen. So here's the thing. There were family members up there, right? And husbands and wives. And like it would be like a group uh, scene. Like, and, and, and you know how, I mean, this is like classic porn where right. the first like five minutes is like the pizza delivery guy. Yeah. He's like talking, schmoozing <laughs> over the- tidy whitey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that part is silent. And um and and some dude on stage who was called up from the audience is like, you know, making up the words that he thinks this dude is saying to this, this mom who like answers the, the door. Most cleverest. It was thing it was ever. Artie said God. it was um so like cringe worthy and uncomfortable and awkward while at the same time hysterical. Was this he, a house party? Um no, it was a party that they rented out a bar at. It's brilliant. And, yeah, and he said. Do you think that, we can make that into some? He I'm said at five. He said it was. It, he said that it was like one of those things, like where you're watching um, a horror movie through your through your hands. Oh my god! Right, right, Because right, you don't right. want to see what's yeah, going to happen next. Yeah, but you do want to see it. But yeah, you're watching it. But at the same oh time, gosh. he said there were like 50 people in the crowd, and they were laughing Peeing their asses off. Yeah. So there is something, obviously it's not porn, but it's, it's, and we, t I think we brought it up recently. It's that science fiction or the mystery science. Theory. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where they yeah, talk I'll the pee movie. my pants. What watching that yeah. show that is. And I think that that would be a fun, uh, that would be a fun podcast. Yeah. To do. Is that like people talking? That's like an alien and a person. Right. And they're in the front row at a movie theater. And you can only see their shadow looking talking up at a about screen. What's on the screen. But the movie is like um, the, the. It's like an old science fiction movie. Yeah. Woman. Attack or the yeah. 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 And they're saying um, stuff like. Uh, uh, you really? Why are you going in there? You know, there's a murderer in there. Like, yeah. why are you going? Yeah. You, like, it. You, you, your kids will love yeah. it, and Not it's on. It. You can watch it on Netflix. Like, it's on. We, my kids love bad lip reading. Have you seen any of that? Yes. Like the NFL bad yes. lip reading. Jimmy Kimmel does that. Oh think, my god! Yes. Like so well, then funny. they will totally love this. Yeah. Totally love this, and they should come out with a show. Like something a little bit more yeah. like do the eighties movies. Yes. Or something like that. Oh, like, yeah. They should do porn karaoke without the porn. That is <laughs> I, I can't even I'm I think I'm gonna do an eighties yeah. karaoke, but in that version. With porn? No. It no, would it, be like sixteen like, candles oh, and oh, when people are trying to talk. And, and, the and, lines out. Yes, but you, they, yeah. we don't want the real lines. If you did we Breakfast Club, I would do the entire movie. But we with don't want the real the lines, lines, though. We don't want the real lines. We want you to make up your lines. All right, that sounds like a good idea, actually. <laughs> Let me see what our guest should yeah, have been here. Is, and look. your phone's on. He's probably trying to call. Hold on. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, Amali and um, Jessica are going to be leaving us for something they consider to be more important than this podcast in just a few minutes, Tim. So it's just going to be you and Tim, me. Tim, just so you know, Alex does this 90% of the other podcasts. So <laughs> it's just that we end it when he leaves. So. Um, I, I leave true. and we can that's continue okay. on with the podcast. Tim, one of the oh. nation's leading authorities on high-risk workplace and human resources issues consults. He's a consultant to uh, HR directors and law enforcement, the media on workplace violence, substance abuse, active shooters. Got that, Jessica? Crime, police procedures, and more. Many and part more. of the SWAT team. Jessica's husband was part of the SWAT team as oh. well. Yes. Yeah, well, t so Tim is uh, is a former police officer. Police officer, officer yeah, yes. Like a in, 20 year, right? Yeah, years, like Tim? in the tough days. Not that it's not tough now, but you were in it when 77 yeah, to Tim 91. Was a badass, too. <laughs> yeah. He uh he now is the president of uh Sachs Consulting and Investigative Services. Uh, but previously, yeah, narcotics detective since the 70s. I'm telling you. In the Akron Police Department. I bet he's got some stories, and we're going to pry it out of him yes. today. Um, but um, let's start with the RNC. That's where I want to start, right? Because Tim, Jessica, as you know, uh, was a security consultant for the RNC. Right. Yeah, we were. We were one of the largest providers for the private security, and we also worked with the uh, the local law enforcement. And 
the federal uh, agencies, and uh, we provided undercovers for um, all the Republican National Convention. Um, we were the sole provider of all the training for all the workers that worked the entire uh, nine days. Um, and we provided security for private. And we also, just two weeks prior to the RNC, were provided a problem from Chief Williams of the Cleveland Police and the federal. And that was they decided that they were not going to allow any vehicles, private vehicles, to enter what we call the cocoon. The cocoon was the security designated security area. Are we allowed to know what those? De- what was the cocoon? Yeah, now you are. <laughs> now you can. I wouldn't have told you <laughs> during the RNC, but I can tell you a lot of stuff now, which is very interesting. But basically, the problem was with the threat of the terrorists and their desire to disrupt national Democrat Republican conventions and political things like that. They were concerned about bombs. They're concerned about other things, assaults or, you know, actual attempts to kill or hurt people, important people. All those people are contained within the security zone, i.e. the cocoon. And the federal government is mandated to protect those people inside the security zone. Unknown to a lot of people across the country, the federal people are not authorized, nor is the tax money able to be spent outside the physical barrier of that security zone. So what happened then is everybody assumed outside the security zone that their stores, their businesses, their people would be protected by federal. And only two weeks before they were kind of clarified that, no, that's not going to happen. You know, and all the police and other types of security within the security zone have to focus and stay focused on the security zone and the people in it. So that brought up two problems. Who's going to protect us, others, outside of that physical security zone? Secondly, they decided they weren't going to allow people, workers, to drive into the security zone. So now they had a problem, and the local police, Cleveland police, and the feds said, it's not our problem because our our jurisdiction is delegates and important people in that we're not responsible for the private businesses. So conveniently, the Cleveland police or, you know, the different uh, entities there said and suggested off the record, you need to get private security. You need to find other ways. Suggested it to the RNC. Suggesting it to the private businesses within greater Cleveland that, We'll do everything we can, but we're really not authorized. We have to focus on the security zone. Which and even the really Cleveland police were focused on that as well. So the basically Cle- they were. When the Cleveland police were in the security zone, working the security zone, that was their focus. Now, the Cleveland police and the other hundreds of different departments across the country, they were all concentrated in the security zone. Now, Cleveland police did provide good security or police officers to work outside the security zone and those that worked outside it protected those that lived and worked outside it so it's not a problem but you got to remember most of the personnel of the law enforcement the focus is to protect that zone long story short there was a problem how do we get all these people into the security zone that are working and now they would have to park 10 miles away and walk to the security zone because they're not going to park anywhere near the security zone because all those parking decks and buildings are inhabited and secured, right? How big is the security zone? Yeah. Uh, the security zone was all of central kind of Cleveland. You, I would say basically if you'd look at 9th Street was a border or close to it. Okay. And the other border would have been um, – the uh, warehouse district there, uh, what is Got that? Uh, like West 9th, West, West 6th. 9th, yeah. Almost 9 to 9, somewhere within there. You know, and then, you know, up towards, uh, you know, of course, uh, Huron, and then down to Lakeside. Yeah. So it's a pretty good zone. And anyway, what happened was they said, you know, basically we got to figure it out. So two weeks before I was thrown this problem, And what we did is we created 
safe zones, one out by Crocker Park and another one. So you were going out. You're talking small local businesses as far as Crocker Park being well, protected. But, but being protected anywhere outside the security zone. It, it, but here's what we did. We created a, a lockdown safety zone out by Crocker Park, and we created another lockdown safety zone on the east side at one of the uh, schools, okay? And the reason for that is we had all the workers drive their personal cars to those secure zones. We then had them park their cars. We, we took former um, military intelligence, military and ex-law enforcement people that worked for me. I had 75 of them. And we secured those parking areas, large parking areas. We put portable uh, cameras up on the poles that are used over in the Middle East. They're all Wi-Fi. We put armed guards there. And I shipped in close to 70, I flatbedded in close to 70 Enterprise 15 passenger vans. And, and you not, shuttled people? And for nine days, three shifts running, wow. we shuttled all the workers in and out of the security zone with an armed guard, armed uh, retired or military guy on the uh, 15 passengers and our people drove it and we had an armed person on there and we met all the several thousands of workers per day at those zones oh nobody knew it these are rnc workers rnc gotcha catering cleaning right. uh, that would have been our kim mccune tim not, not so now that it's been uh two three years right since two then years, yeah um, can you talk about any threats that you became aware of during that time? Yeah, there were, um, there were threats, um, from uh, terrorist threats that, uh, they were looking to see if there was weaknesses that they could expound on. Um, uh, one of the things that they were concerned about that, that obviously wasn't uh, revealed during it, we were worried about what we call decoying, decoy attacks. So maybe... A little bomb goes off on the northeast corner of downtown, and all the police and the security rush to that area. Right. And then, boom, when they the majority get to that area, they then really do a large attack on the opposite side of the security Well, that's zone. what the Boston Marathon bombing was exactly. all about. Exactly. The Boston Marathon is a perfect example. Yeah. Blow it up at the, at the finish line. Let everybody start running in right. a direction you know they're going to go delay other bombs you know and las vegas shooter did the same thing he shot into the crowd okay and he let the crowd get fired up confused bloody and dead and he knew that they would run towards the exit and he gave them you know a good couple minutes to get confused they all ran towards the exit and that's why he busted out that second window because the second window was angled at the exit that he knew they were going to run. So main window, decoy shooting, cause confusion, right. cause you know, carnage. They give them a 30-second minute to run. They run there, go to the other window, hit it. So they were concerned that the terrorists were looking for what, what we call decoying, and they thought that that potentially would happen. The other concern they had was pro-Trump versus anti-Trump. Because it's pretty volatile. Um, really? That, uh, <laughs> you know, that doesn't the, the, the matter which side you're on, that, you know, yeah. they were going to clash. Um, did, did you did you become aware of any specific threats from, like, a particular domestic terrorist group or a particular Middle Eastern, you know, fundamentalist group? Or anything there was like no that? specific groups identified. Okay. Um, but there was... They're basic. There was a lot of chatter. There was a lot of conversation. There was a lot of desire. And like anything else, terrorists are just like criminals. They, they're they they're going to be around, but they want to make sh sure before they do something that they can do it, that they can succeed, and that they can succeed big. They do not want to do something and fail right. or get caught or get or killed. Or do two people or they want to make it big. Yeah, they, they want numbers and they want big. They want international media news. If they can't get that, they won't do it because that hurts their recruiting. You know, they use those those actions for recruiting. Tim, um, let's rewind to the 70s for a minute. Um, walk us through what made you want to be 
a police officer and then what that journey was like through your becoming a narcotics detective. Yeah. You know, you got to go back to childhood for some reason. As a kid, I grew up watching the Lone Ranger and those types. And, you know, my parents, my family, large family, large Italian on one side, large Greek on the other. I mean, massive amount of family. Is that in Cleveland, Akron? Uh, Akron, okay. Northeastern Ohio. Um, and, you know, um, the whole thing from both sides and all the family was there was such a strong moral, ethical, do what's right mm -hmm. and work with your neighbor and work with your family and love your family and neighbor and you know oh can we just go back to bring that it back. uh oh can we gosh. go back to it i think we all would love to go back to it but you know it affected me it said i want to grow up and i want to help people and i want to do something and i want to do it right and what piece of the pie can i contribute to a positive world i mean you know a really strong influence you know, from from my parents and grandparents, you know, hardworking, you know, you talk about work ethics and you talk about, you know, a handshake, meaning something more than a 16 page document or contract, you know, and, and, you know, you can just go right down the line with your family. And then my family all pitching in at different businesses and stuff during holidays and during rough times our families would rally around each other to help each other. So I kind of grew up around that. You know, <clears throat> watching the TV and the good stuff and just wanted to do it. And, you know, ever since high school, I wanted to be a law enforcement. I wanted to be a policeman, you know. And I went to college, got a four-year degree, and, you know, Denison University, a good college. Is that, is that Indiana? Denison is in uh, Granville, Ohio, right by Columbus. It's a oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay. It's a it's yeah. a pretty it's a it's smaller a college, high. but it's a highly acclaimed yes. college. It's you know, but bottom line is I, I went there and um, during my senior year, I started taking police tests and I took multiple tests because, you know, you take one, you do well, take one, you do bad, you know, and um, <clears throat> my senior year and um, took the Akron police test and, um, you know, 500 people. I finished 27th. Nice. I, I was, you know, yeah. proud of myself. And I was one of the youngest uh, of two people, the youngest to go into the academy and went right into the academy. And um, but my goal wasn't to stay in patrol. Nothing wrong with patrol. God bless all the patrolmen. But, you know, I just I'm a doer. You know, I'm, I'm 150 percent mile an hour guy. So patrol wasn't going to be where I was going to stay. How know? long were you doing patrolman work? I did patrol for two years. In downtown Akron. In downtown Akron. All right. So um, I, my first job as a lawyer was on the corner of State and Main next to the ballpark yep. over there. And Did you get a ticket you want him to no, fix? But I will, no, but here's <laughs> the thing. So that was in 2001. And when I worked late, I was afraid to walk outside. Yeah. Right. It was across from that building where the AA was founded and then the bus station was up the street. Yeah. And I thought I was going to get killed like every single night. What was it like in the 70s? Is yeah. It similar. The, well, the 70s, you know, is different than it is today. But 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 the 70s was, you know, um, a lot of times you were on your own as a police officer. We didn't have a lot of policemen and policemen were expected to handle it you know handle the situation you know and one or two of you go to this call whether it's a domestic a robbery you know um you know gangs or whatever it didn't matter but you just didn't have the massive amount of police officers and you really learned how to really be careful and how to be strategically safe and how to utilize a lot of tools and the tools are people skills you know how to approach people how to talk to them how to get them you know to respect you how to how to how to you know even you know even it up you know i was going to say you back then you were actually respected so when you went to a call not that it was any easier but no. you know you were like the police officer and that person stopped yeah, the badge meant something. Right. You know, would you have someone rarely tell you, go go south? Yeah, it'd be a rarity. Sure. Whereas today, 
That's the it, norm. It's the norm. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's it's significantly different. But, you know, I worked patrol and I worked and I bounced around a bunch of different cars, different areas and different neighborhoods, different experiences. But it was really good for me. Um, and but, then right into detective? Well, no. What happened then is um, it was weird because back then I was one of only three people in the entire academy class that had a college degree. Because mm-hmm. back then a lot of policemen went from high school mm-hmm. or working a few jobs and went right into. They really didn't, I'll say, emphasize the importance or even the respect if you had a college degree. Back then you didn't need it. And almost it was looked down upon. Oh, you know, you went to college, you know. What are you doing here? Mr. Fancy Pants. But anyway, uh, I got hand-selected at one of seven to go into what we call a high crimes unit that they created. And they were looking for some young, uh, eager, intelligent, uh, moldable type of people. And I was blessed to be picked. And I worked seven years in the uh, high crimes unit. And what's and high crime? Is that the high mob? crimes? We worked anything that was. I'm waiting for the mob stories. Yeah, it was anything that was an extremely more serious crime. It could be a serial rapist. It could be uh, uh, a theft gang. It could be a, a, a mob mm-hmm. s- situation going on. It anything that was more of the really serious type of uh, crime. And while I was on the high crimes unit. I also then got pulled and retrained on the SWAT. So the high crimes unit became part of the SWAT, and we did our job. And then when, when the SWAT situations happened, it, um, you know, we got called in as a booster unit to the SWAT. In fact, we were the actually the core, one of the cores of the SWAT because we worked, you know, we worked the late hours at night, which were a lot of serious crime happening. But with everything I'm telling you, which was great. I got extra training. I got this training, that training, sent for more. I learned so much more, and I was so excited about it that I think it's one reason they uh, say they like to pick me for things. I was a sponge, you know, and then, and then you use that, that knowledge. I, I think knowledge is king, you know, and then you can apply it. So then um, I stayed with the high crimes unit with the SWAT team, but what happened there was – uh, after that, I then, after seven years on that, I got asked to go to narcotics. And I really struggled with that decision. And I went to my immediate boss in my um, high crimes unit, who is probably one of the best bosses, mentors I ever had. Just one of them guys that just stands out. And he really was good. Um, and I said, I don't know what to do. You know, I really like it here at this unit. Yeah, I really like working the SWAT and the high crimes, but I said narcotics is a new challenge. I've never it'd be I'd be a whole new learning, and I said and I love working for you, and um, he said he looked me right in the eyes and he said Tim, I'm not always going to be your boss, so you got to make a decision based on more longer term, and when he told me that I went home I thought about it the next day I said I'll take it. So I went into undercover for five years, multi-state, multi-jurisdiction undercover. But I'll back up a minute. On the SWAT team, I had 167 armed one-on-one confrontations. What? Wow. All right, because our listeners like the juicy stuff, let's dig into that. Like, give us some. That's crazy. Give us some of those. Um, if you can relive them, I don't no, want to. No, I mean, you're in 1970. I mean, the mob was like heavy. Here, Molly, here. Molly, Molly wants to hear mob I'm stories. A... Molly, well, listen, my... I know I know how to talk to former cops. This is how you got to ask that question. You got to say, Tim, what's your favorite story <laughs> from that time period? <laughs> I want a mob story, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, well story you know, you've told a hundred thousand times already. Yeah, that's the one we want. That's the one. Room. That's the one, that's the one want. Molly wants to hear. Yeah. Well, don't forget to ask me that about the narcotics, because I have a oh, very good oh, one yeah. for that. Yeah, it's our Molly's going to be listening to that. I think the, <laughs> yeah. the actually the best stories on on the SWAT is I got trained, um, and not only to be on SWAT within a year or two, they retrained me to be first entry person. That's why I had all these Ooh. armed confrontations. So I was trained to crawl through the window, the door, the basement window, the roof, what the heck. 
and go in and find the armed subject and disarm them um, or confront them. And um, it, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different psychology. But what I learned about the human nature and what I learned from the beginning of doing it and getting better at it and, and not screwing up and the little things at the end. And you ask for stories. The stories are, as I got more mature in my job and learned it, I was able to successfully convince people who were seriously armed with guns, knives, and shotguns to walk out with me. And that was the greatest pleasure because at the beginning, I was fighting and struggling more because of my lack of experience and knowledge. And... Um, not that what I did was wrong, but I didn't realize all the tools that I had that I needed. And by the time I got towards the middle or end of my SWAT, I was able to talk to people and convince people to put guns and knives down instead of fighting me. Is it true that they you want to get personal with them? I've always heard that. Well, Even they, in, if you're attacked... You're, you're supposed, if you can engage with them and ask them about their family, or it, it tends to... You know, um, a, a, a good story, you want a story, is yes. I crawled in, I'm going through a window, and damn it, my foot hits the window ledge, which causes the window to slam shut oh. that we had opened. We had a piece of wood holding it up. And I just was barely in, and my last foot hit that piece of wood, and ksh, that window shut. And as I pulled my foot in and stood up, I'm looking 12 feet down a hallway, and he's looking at me. Oh, my gosh. He has a gun. I have a gun. It's a real Western. And, and he looks at me like, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And there's a look when someone's going to kill you. He started to bring the gun up, and I said, I'm not interested in shooting you. And he put the gun down to his side. I said, I got your mom and your brother standing outside. They love you, and they want to see you, and they don't want to see you dead. My goal is to walk out with you, and I'm not going to pull my gun out unless you decide I need to. It's your decision. I'm going to base this whole outcome on what you want to do. Now, that was the psychology that right, I learned. Giving him, con giving him control. control. Letting him know I don't have hatred for him. All those little subtle things in that conversation. And he said, do you really mean it? And I said, you don't see me shooting you because I could. And I said, and I'd be totally justified at this point. I said, unless you put that gun on that counter, I said, I might shoot you. I might have to shoot you. I said, or we can walk out together. And that's what I prefer. I said, once again, I said, your mom and your brother want, want you to see you. He put the gun on the counter and he said, he said, I believe you. And we walked out. Now, I've had a couple of those, but that one just kind of stands out in my head because, you know, at any moment, it would only take two, three seconds for him to shoot me. Mm -hmm. See, I always marvel at the fact that police officers who have that many confrontations where they at some point that day think, I might not walk out of this, right? You yeah. have to have had that thought yeah, a you do. A you, hundreds of times. You live with it, you understand but, it, you respect it. But the thing of it is, I always marvel at the fact that you then go home and then you wake up the next day and go back and do it again, Yeah. right? Like, I think that your body goes into a form of shock when it's put into a life and death life and death situation and your and your mind does and all the adrenaline goes to your extremities and um you you know you, you like your body chemistry changes right your brain chemistry changes 
And I think that's one of the reasons why they put officers on leave for a couple days after they've been in any kind of shooting. Yeah, right? they got to decompress. Exactly. So that amazes me that after you've done that, you can you, you're not hanging it up. You're you're getting right back in there, right? And and getting ready for more. And by the way, um, at this time, uh, do you have a wife and kids? Yes. So what what's what's their life like at this time? Um, you know, it's really amazing as a police officer. If you're a police officer and you marry after you're a police officer, your marriage has a much stronger success rate mm. than if you marry and you're, let's just say you're working a machine shop, you're, yeah, yeah. you're working as an attorney, you're working as whatever, because we've had them come from all walks of life, and you become a police officer after you're married and you go from a different job to a police officer's job, um, those marriages have lower success rates. Yeah. Because she's saying, or he, I knew it. Well, I got here, into this marriage knowing. Yeah. He, yeah. 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 They're, they're already like my wife met me. She already knew I was a cop. She already knew right. I was carrying a gun. She already heard the stories. She Was you, your husband a cop? When you met him? No, we were in high school. We oh, that's high. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're it's, doomed. Yeah. Just well, so you know. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just, I'm saying it's a harder adjustment. But I would suppose that would be just uh, be hard for any marriage where the job changes if it has right. if it has more demand on it, you know. But in police work and fire work and safety forces, you know, and it's just like going overseas in military. You know, you're married. You know, the guy joins the military, and boom, he's overseas for a couple of years. A lot of those marriages don't make it, you yeah. know. Tim, um, so you're a detective, and something happens that leads you to uh, leave the force and start and, and and become an entrepreneur instead. What 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 is that story? Well, what had happened is I went through uh, narcotics. Um, <clears throat> You know, I've always had, I think, entrepreneur blood. So I think it's always been there. Why? Because all my family, aunts and uncles, all started their own businesses. I worked for all of them. So I'm coming from an era of being involved with family that was entrepreneurs. So I get out. I, 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 I get I get done with nar SWAT, narcotics, undercover. I come back. I take over the narcotics unit. Um, I get nominated by the attorney general. Uh, for policeman of the year, they give it to one guy in the entire state. I get it. Oh my god! Awesome. You know, and I don't really broadcast that a lot, but it's yeah, it's you a just great did to a million uh, listeners. Yeah, well, I'm glad. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I gotta, I gotta at least take a bow. You know, yeah. one one cop a year out of the whole state of Ohio gets it. I got it. What year was this? Uh, 1989. Okay. Here, hold hold that thought. Uh, high note. These two have to go, and Molly has to take her selfie. Here, we're gonna take we're gonna take a short break, and then Tim is gonna finish his story right after this break. Hey, folks, Alex Gertzberg here. I am CEO of the Gertzberg Law Firm and cover my six. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about something special we're doing at Cover My Six. If you own or run a business, I want you to go to CoverMySix.com to see if you qualify for a no-cost business vulnerability assessment. My business lawyers will meet with you in person, go over your customer contract, your employee handbook, and your other key legal documents, and help you spot any legal minefields that they see. We'll also give you some guidance on how to stop those minefields from blowing up your business. So go to CoverMySix.com to see if you qualify and to sign up. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the show. All right, we are back. We are down two ladies uh, who had to leave for uh, whatever uh, event they were going to, uh, and uh, we're back here with Tim Dimoff. Tim, you were in the middle of your story about your... Uh, last day or days with the Akron Police Department. So pick up where you left off. Yeah, basically, uh, I was with narcotics. I left narcotics. I, 
undercover narcotics and I came back and I started running the narcotics division. We had a very successful narcotics division. Um, I ended up um, doing an investigation on a gentleman that was the largest landlord for the Akron University and all of his houses and rental properties, he paid cash for them. And we started to do an extensive 13 month investigation and that investigation ultimately led to a large national tie into a gentleman named Felipe Provincio, who was an illegal immigrant from Mexico, and they were running a very large narcotics uh, transcontinental across the country, up into Akron type of narcotics. And we busted him, we busted Felipe and all of their people. Um, and totally uh, convicted them and went on. After that, um, more cases, more things. Three years later, uh, I was nominated and received International Narcotic Officer of the Year Mm -hmm. due to that case and some others, uh, which I was proud of. Um, And then after that, uh, more work, major crimes, et cetera. And then um, I got injured on a drug raid, I was in rehab for about a year, came back out of that, still did some law enforcement. But that's when God told me it was time to leave. And and I did leave. Um, and, you know. So what, what what's the time period now? Now we're talking, you know, in the mid-90s. Okay. And, you know, it's the old saying, when God closes one door, he opens up another one. Mine was down the hall to the left. And I just couldn't see it. And, um. I was bummed out. Um, I was bummed out initially, but eventually I started to seek um, and started to study what was going on out there in the real world. And I told my wife, I'm going to chase the American dream and start my own business. And my wife's response was, well, here we go. (laughs) You know, doesn't surprise her. And she fully supported it. And we started a company based on my research. I did a research for a year. And I found out that the human resource and the security divisions of companies, now back, we're talking 20-some years, that the security and the HR divisions of companies didn't talk to each other, didn't think they needed to. And I was the first pilot program pioneer in the United States to say, no, let's combine and let's have HR security and all those kind of issues. Let's get them under one umbrella. Thus, Sachs Consulting was born with the premise of we need to take away the silos with inside the businesses. And I started to develop training programs and policies and stuff that I was familiar with, which was, you know, drug testing, drug identification, um, litigation issues, companies testifying to defend themselves and those kind of things and then workplace violence came along and then of course move it ahead another 10 years and here we are with active shooters so basically my company specializes in high risk workplace issues we have a very unique niche because we deal with the high risk stuff the workplace violence the bullying the harassment the discrimination the active shooter, the uh, diffusing and dealing difficult people. And we are a front runner nationally in that area today. And there's very few companies across the country that specialize in the high risk area specifically. And on top of that, you also do private investigations. Yeah. And as part of that, we saw a need to assist companies, individuals, uh, work with attorneys, CPA firms, corporations internally um, to solve a lot of different investigations or problems. So we now have one of the largest investigation firms in Ohio. We go national on that. We do high high risk security stuff like the Republican National Convention, other events or companies that really want a more higher level. Right now we're providing security and we're doing physical security analysis for churches, houses of worship, nonprofit, for profit, um, it's a runaway train. Aggression is bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, just to, <laughs> on a personal note, I mean, we hired you guys 
defined assets that we were chasing after for one of our defendants that we sued. We got a judgment against him, and within a 24-hour period, you told us where where the money was. Um, so you you guys really are sort of a, a jack of all trades. But where's the bell curve? I mean, the the, the center of mass for your your clients is it the active shooter stuff? Is it the is it the security? Uh, I mean, what's where does most of your uh, clients at what do that was an inartfully asked question what do most of where does most of your business come from it comes from a handful and the handful is first management training of course in all those areas that i mentioned active shooter workplace violence bullying harassment discrimination so a lot of training uh, companies are asking for a lot of training in the aggressive areas, the active shooter, diffusing and dealing with difficult people. Okay, training's huge. Physical security analysis, going into a single building, a campus, a school, a church, mm -hmm. and doing a physical security analysis of the physical, the electronic, and the people flow. That is huge. We do that across the country. We're doing multiple locations for major companies. We're doing churches, campuses, etc. Investigations, huge demand with problems that come up, both personal and professional and corporate. Lots of needs for investigation. You look at corporate alone, abuse of workers' comp, abuse of FMLA, mm. you know, non-compete violations, internal thefts, you know, sexual harassment, all those things, investigations. And then the last area is security companies and events that want high level security that's private that's the same caliber of law enforcement so our people are ex-military military intelligence law enforcement federal agents we bring them all together and we can provide that same high level of security there's other ancillaries but when it comes down to it though th that's that's our core so so Tim let me ask uh, le le let me ask a question that I I actually get um, from our clients who have disgruntled employees right uh, you let them go they feel they've been wronged um, so <laughs> I'm sure that um, there are folks listening to this episode right now who are are uh, worried about that, who may have to let somebody go and maybe even in the next couple of weeks, who they're just not sure how they're going to take it. What's the recommendation when you are about to encounter or let somebody go who you're just not sure they're going to take it that well and you're not sure how they're going to react? They might be unstable, whatever. What's your recommendation? Our recommendation is we've been tracking and the other thing is we research the trends and we're kind of the front runner. We see the trends before the trends get well known and we respond to that. And, and, and what you just described is a good example. Ten years ago, I got two or three calls a year about we're going to terminate an employee. He's a ticking time bomb or we just terminated him. This guy is threatening and has threatened us two to three per year. Ten years ago, we are averaging today what we call terminated employee threats. Yeah. OK, we are averaging seven to ten per month. Per month. We have gone to the extent to create what I think is the first terminated employee threat response team. We are now going into the mode and we do get calls every week about terminated employees who have made threats or they're fearful when they terminate them, as you said, they will. We basically assist that company with that termination. We provide security during that termination. We then do a profile on that individual. We dig in and find out what's going on in their life. You know, are they a drug user? Are they alcoholic? Are they going through a divorce? Do they have a history of violence, etc.? We also then provide security at that location for a minimum of four weeks or more. We then do the profile. We then track that person. We give an understanding. If in the end we don't see this person pulling back and decreasing their aggression, we then seek them out and we talk to them, go find them and meet them, and we de we diffuse them. We psychologically attempt to diffuse them, which we've been very successful in. And no more do companies need or should take a terminated hothead 
ticking time bomb and say, well, let's keep our fingers crossed and hope it doesn't ha nothing happens. We have these people being terminated. They they threaten people. They drive by uh, supervisors houses. They scratch a key cars. They throw eggs. They threaten. They use the Internet, the whole thing. And many times they do intimidate or threaten and they tell those people, I know where you live. I know where your wife works. I know where your kids go to school. So this gets complicated. So so what's your advice to those employers? My advice to those employers is, and I don't want to sell like a salesman, but if you've got a ticking time bomb or potential ticking time bomb, you need to have outside help or assistance during the termination. You need to do an evaluation of that person, and you need to engage some company to help do some level of extra security and also to be ready to respond if that person escalates their aggression. You know, just having that company in your back pocket, even if you do nothing, at least engaging that company and say, we want you to stay tight on this. We don't know which direction it's going to go, yeah. but there are little things we can do. Bottom line, I would increase the security temporarily at the physical facility where that person was terminated from gotcha. because that sends a message to your employees currently that it's unacceptable and that person that made the threat they always find out that you have extra security there because of them that helps defuse them uh how many folks you got working for you these days tim well between our full-time and part-time we're we're 70 80 people so so just putting your business owner hat on right I'm going to ask this next question uh, both for you personally and then also for your organization. And the question is, uh, for you personally first, what is a habit or routine that you personally do on a regular basis that has given you the most mileage? What's something that you do regularly that has multiplied for you as a in terms of results? Well, if, if I had to summarize what one single process works the best in this complicated electronic business building world without a doubt it's meet people meet people meet people i'm the i'm 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 the king kong of meeting people i meet more people for coffee breakfast lunch i meet more people stop their office have them come to my office because I'm still a firm believer you can have all the electronics you want, and I think it works, and we're big on social media. But if you first meet that person, somehow meet them face-to-face, -face, put a face with a name, and then after that, we have the advantage today of using electronics to continue that re relationship without having to meet as often physically. There's just something different about meeting someone face to face. And I'll tell you what the difference is. The relationship, friendship, business ship lasts enormously longer. So same question, but for your business, right? What is a process or a habit uh, or a routine that you guys do in your business that's given your, your business the most traction, the most mileage? Um, once again, I think it's getting all of my key people. I have about 20 key people, about 15 real key people, and it's getting them to want and enjoy and see the value in building relationships. It really is. So it's similar to what you personally do in your personal life. Yeah. You, you've you've, you've um, internalized it or systematized it inside your business among these key. Leaders. I call them touches. Okay. And I talk to my people all the time. How? I'll give you an example. Two years ago, I, I got my key 15 people together. We meet once a month and we talk strategy. What are we doing right, wrong, you know, strengths, weaknesses, that whole SWAT thing. And then we talk about what we've done and who we met. But I two years ago, I said in January, this year, 
I want to simplify it, and I try not to have like t- ten goals for the company. I always try to have one or two. And I said this year we have one, and it's called touches. I want everybody in this room to figure out how they can create a touch. Increase your touches 10, 15, 20%. You pick it. And what are touches? Touches are anything but electronic. Anything. Coffee, breakfast, lunch, same thing. Um, Going to their business. Meeting them at a trade show and saying thanks. Sending them a written thank you note. Okay? Anyway... I said, let's all collectively be dedicated to touches. At the end of that year, we had a record year. Record. Not barely record. I mean hmm. way beyond. And and we all agreed that it was the touches. And and the thing is, you can't you can't force people to like touches. So in order for my people to do touches, they really had to enjoy it because if they didn't enjoy it, the touches are kind of blasé. <clears throat> and what was really satisfying to me was all my employees that I asked, my core, core 15, they loved the ability and the fact I pushed them to do more touches. And when I pushed them, you're a business owner, I had to pay for more lunches, breakfast, coffees. But that's all right. I, I had to pay for more mileage. Yeah. But it, it is all right. <clears throat> because when I added it up at the end, I looked at it and I said, well, really? What was the cost? Well, you know, ironically, my cost for us increasing our touches, okay, was it did not exceed $5,000 that whole year. Hmm. I mean, you add up a bunch of lunches and breakfasts and coffees, and I tell them, I'll pay for it. No problem. Okay? And let's just say it was $10,000. let us just be drastic. We can get one contract and pay for all that. Right. One. Right. So you can't argue with me that, that it costs you and it can put you out of business. I say... How can you not afford to do more touches? Right. All right, Tim, we've got four minutes. This is the lightning round. You ready? Yep. So we're going to do Molly's questions first. Uh, what are you binging on TV right now? Uh, only I don't watch a lot of TV, but if I'm binging, I got to tell you, I'm a Shark Tank guy. Interesting. And America's Got Talent. <laughs> right. I, I, I love anything that's challenging and new. Yeah. Uh, Molly would next be asking you, uh, fill in the blank. A perfect day for me is a perfect day for me is when I could solve and give a real sense of calmness to three clients who call me with three problems. Excellent. Uh, a song I never want to hear again is. I'm not a big song guy, and uh, I couldn't give you a song that I never want to hear. Um, I couldn't give you a song I want to hear. I, I'm not big in, into music. I like music, but I don't attach myself to seriousness. I'm actually really glad you said that, because anytime somebody answers it and I know the freaking song, it's now an earworm, and I'm hearing it in my head the rest of the night. All right. My lightning round questions are, you are stranded on a desert island for a minimum of three months, and you may bring with you any single author whose entire bibliography you'll have access to for the entire time you're here. So you're going to read one author for the potentially the rest of your life. Who's the author? Richard Branson. Ooh, interesting. Because the guy's done amazing things, and he still maintained a great personality. And he's an amazing guy. Uh, all kinds of learning disabilities that guy has. Overcame mm-hmm. all of them. Dyslexia, uh, ADHD, overcomes all of it. Starts Virgin Airlines. I, I love that dude. You know, he started Virgin Airlines uh, because he was sick of uh, of waiting uh, for the right flight. And he just asked a bunch of people who were waiting in line with him if they would pay him like 100 bucks or whatever it was to charter a flight and he chartered one flight just to help the people in a group that got delayed 
And he's like, shit, I can do this with an entire airline, start an airline that way. Filling a need for people who are. Uh, That's great. Um, you may interview, this, this, this question is in honor of a guest that we had. Her name was Christy George, who uh, uh, her question is this. She's a journalist. You can interview any single person who's ever lived. Who would you interview? Abraham Lincoln. I think interesting the decision he had to make about you know freeing the slaves with all the pressure on both sides and the guy's decision was based on not what everybody thought but what he thought was the right thing to do and I don't think a lot of other smart people good people in his position would have based it on what's the right decision yeah he's a fascinating dude too did you ever read team of rivals uh-uh. great book uh, doris see. kern's good good one one of the best books i've ever read he's another dude suffered from depression his entire life um oh he's fascinating uh all right this is the most difficult lightning round question which mm -hmm. is why we leave it for the end um an embarrassing thing about yourself that very few people know and for extra credit that nobody else knows. <laughs> well, I can tell you an embarrassing thing and is back in college streaking was big. <laughs> so, Excellent. so I was a streaker amongst <laughs> other streakers and that goes back to college and that's probably both an embarrassing, I don't know, semi-embarrassing, and probably the big thing that nobody really knows except people that went to college with me. All right. But, I I, I mean, that's a great one. You know, as far as <laughs> Aren't you glad they didn't have smartphones back then? Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we but back then, I got to be honest, if they had smartphones, probably wouldn't have mattered to me. You know, <laughs> you're in college, you're on a campus. It's sort of like a, a private village. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. you do what you want to do. And um, there it goes. My wife asked me, my God, if all those people that you met and that knew that you were streaking, I said, you know what? I would just admit to it and tell them, hey, you know, I was in college. I was dumb and stupid. And I was doing stupid stuff like everybody else. And I would say to them, tell me a person here today that doesn't have something right or several things they did in college that you can't, you don't want you know, to talk about. In the about. grand scheme of things, it's a victimless crime generally, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as long as there's not kids around, yeah. right? You're doing, people do crazy things. Yeah. Tim Dimoff, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, anything you're working on now that you want to put out there to the universe? Anything new and exciting at Sachs Consulting or, or, or in your personal life? Well, I you know, I'll tell you something really far fetched that I'm that I'm really into and I'm I'm working on it. Back when I was on the police department, I was probably one of few across the country that would work with psychics on cases. Interesting. Okay. And the key there was there's like any profession, there's a lot of good and bad and, and well intentioned or I'll say talented. And what I've done over the years on the police department and in in uh, on the private side now, and what I'm really focusing on now, which is my kind of out of, I always like to have an out of the box thing I'm trying to do. I'm working on developing a better and stronger psychic group that is working, going to be and has worked with me and our investigators to help us do a better job on special cases that we get called into like suicide murder cases that have not been solved whether it was suicide or murder uh, missing people and stuff like that so right now i'm developing a course for law enforcement private security and that on how you filter out the right psychics how you work with them and really what their purpose is because they're not going to look in a crystal ball and tell you that tim demoff committed this crime but they can use their abilities. Everybody has special abilities. I tell people, do you think LeBron James has a special ability above others? Yes, he does. And other athletes. 
well, don't you think a psychic could have a basic human spiritual ability above others? Yes, they can. But you got to know how to filter them out. You also got to know how to work with them. And you also have to understand they're not going to look in a crystal ball and tell you the clear cut answer. But they can supply pieces of everything that happened in a crime or a situation that could be a handful of missing pieces that can help you put it together. Hmm. And I'm developing that process now of how we can do it and how I can train others to do it. So it's a real out of the box thing. Yeah. And I'm fascinated by it and I'm reading up on it and I'm amazed at some of the psychics in the world, what their real ability is. And it's not fake. It's, 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 it's not exacerbated. I mean, when, when some psychics can, can work with people and talk about facts that are not, known to anybody or very few and i'm not talking about the crazy stuff i'm talking about down to earth stuff interesting uh yeah that is definitely outside the box tim yeah. that's good stuff hey listen thanks for for joining us uh the thing is tim that we have had now 90 plus guests all from different kinds of companies predominantly business owners and that's the goal I can honestly say that you are the first the first private investigator, former police detective, security consultant mm. that we've had, and it's been interesting. Um, and so you're going to have to probably come back again and uh, tell us uh, the, next, uh, the next phase of the journey uh, uh, the next time. Folks, if you've been listening this far, that means that you are either uh, Tim's wife or uh, my girlfriend, <laughs> or Molly and Jessica to see how this... No, that's not true. We had 1,500 downloads last, last year, last year, last month. Oh last God. month, we had 1,500 downloads. So this that's thing is... fantastic. Yeah, it's been really... I mean, I, I've been um, pleasantly surprised at how consistently upticking this podcast has been, uh, in no small part because of the quality of our guests and you are one of them tim so thank you and folks for the for, for those of you who have listened this far thank you if you um, are uh, listening to us on uh, some platform on your smartphone um, go you're almost certainly able to leave us a rating and that would be great if you're listening to us through your computer that makes it even easier uh, but find a way to do that, and, and uh, Molly and I would be grateful to you. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.